All right, everybody, welcome back. This is uh, Instructor Phil Dimitriotis. We're going to be doing a demo today talking about drawing on tone paper, a digital drawing technique that's something that is transferred over from a wonderful uh, traditional technique that's been around for a very long time. Okay, before we get into that, um, I need to address some of you that are working in Sketchbook Pro, which is an outstanding drawing program. There's a couple things you might not be aware of, so I want to cover those about image size. I want to discuss when you open up image, let's say if I were to open this up and I start drawing right here, I grab a layer uh, and I'm going to start to sketch. Oops, I don't want to be in red. Uh, let's say we're going to go ahead and, and rough out in like a gray here, okay? So let's say I'm going to start sketching something. You need to be concerned about image size. Some people tend to forget that, so I thought I'd cover that really quick, okay? So if I come over here under image and I go down to image size, if you look, it'll bring up this box option right now this image is 9.9 .9 inches by 19, but of a resolution of only 100 dpi. What that means is that if I were to, which this image looks like it's 11 by 17, it's a little bit larger. Problem with that, only 100 dpi, if I bring that into Photoshop, it's going to totally change the look and the image will be a lot smaller Then I'll have to transform it. So what I think is a really great idea that you can do is if you come under image and image size here, um, you could just readjust that and go to a higher size. So let's say I'm going to go ahead and put this at, I want the height to be 11, and then I want, now it's on an automatic set here so I can take off key proportions. I can put this to 17, so that way all my pages would make sense in my portfolio and they all print out correctly. I prefer to do that with a lot of work, 11 by 17 is a standard image, and then if you want to print it smaller, it prints to 8.5 by 14, which is legal size, right? I'm going to put 200 dpi in here real quick. Okay, so if I scroll down and look, that's 11 by 17 piece of paper. Let's go back and check it. Image size, 11 by 17, 200. One of the things you'll notice in sketchbook is going to be sometimes the pencil. So I drew the, on this really quick. Because see the pencil line now? It's much thinner. Do you see that? So that's one of the, the trade-offs with in Sketchbook Pro when increasing the image size. See my previous scribble here was a lot thicker. Now my line's a whole lot thinner. So if I want to enlarge this, I can still get a good pencil line. You see that? This pencil line here now on this side is very similar to this pencil line there in terms of the thickness. However, though, I'm at 200 dpi, which is a huge difference in the way that it's going to print and the way that it's going to save. Okay, all right. So I just thought I'd cover some basics there about image size. Try to avoid working in 100 dpi because it's just flat. There's not much that you can do with it. And if you ever go to print that, if you have good drawings you want to put in your portfolio, they're not going to look that great when you go to print it. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do here is I gave you guys a paper folder. Okay, so let's go over. It's really easy. A lot of us know how to open up that paper folder inside um, uh, Photoshop. Let's just go back over here in Sketchbook. We're going to go to File. It's really easy. We go to Add Image. Okay, I'm going to go back over here. I have to go to my desktop. Um, I have to go into my hard drive here really quick, which is my Lacey drive here. Fills classes. Classes. Let's jump down here. 107. There's my paper folder. Now you see I have them labeled here. I have base paper, Canson paper. I'm going to go ahead and pull some of these up and show you the difference. Okay, so if I look at this one here, it's going to open up. This one's opening up a little bit smaller. I can enlarge it. Okay, just by after it puts it in here, I have this little tool here, so I can uh, scale. I might scale a little bit this way. Okay, I might scale a little bit this way to the side. All right, going out this way a little bit there. I basically have a full piece of paper there. That's just one version of the paper samples. Okay, uh, that's not one of the ones that I scanned. Okay, but that's just a base version. So I'm going to add a couple more. I'm going to add another layer here. Okay, I'm going to come back here. Let's go back under File again, and we're going to go to Add Image. And then this time I'm going to go over here to the Canson paper right there. And wait a second. There it is. That's the one I scanned. That is a traditional Strathmore 300 DPI scan. You can see how large it is. It fit right in there. It's just another example of tone paper for you. Okay. Um, I prefer that one because I have that in my sketchbook. I actually have it in a warm gray and then a light tone gray. Okay. All right. Let's try another one. If I just want to show you some of the differences here that I gave you. File, add image. And let's look at this one right here. Now, this one, um, hold on, was this it? This one has holes in it. Do you see that? I thought that was sort of cool to work digitally. So it looks like you scan part of your sketchbook. Do you see that? So if you want to leave it there, you can. You have the little holes on the side. So you can literally put that in your portfolio and make it look like it's a traditional uh, sketch that you've done, but it's not. It's something that's digital based, okay? 
and let's go through here and oops deleted a layer really quick let's take that off let's add another layer let's go back into file here let's go to add image and there's a there's this rough paper right here there's another one here called class 9 I think a student did something there and I put some other textured variations that are available on the internet there I just put those they're just JPEGs you can create your own or expand off of them if you like let me open up this image and let's take a look now that's a this is another type of paper it's a much rougher paper it almost feels like the same consistency of like a paper bag okay all right so now that I have that if you look in my layers I have all these different paper settings okay I would recommend that you don't draw on the paper you draw on a layer above that we're gonna to get to that in just a minute okay so what I wanted to do next year is I wanted to talk about what exactly the style of drawing that we're gonna get into and I think a really good example of this is for us to take a look at Alfonso Mucha okay some people say Mucha Mucha I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Prague when I was younger and I got to see some of his original sketches and his paintings uh, he's a Czechoslovakian or Slovakian painter okay he's just absolutely amazing you guys know him for his his Art Nouveau girls he also did a bunch of wonderful full style paintings on the history of the Slovakian wars and everything so he's done a lot of wonderful work this is basically what we're gonna be doing is um, I had a student ask me once and say didn't someone create this style of drawing at Concept Design Academy and I was like no it's been around for a very long time it's just everyone a lot many artists old masters have worked on tone paper with a graphite or, or some type of I don't think they had Prismacolor back then but some type of graphite based pencil with white and the great thing about that the great tech why this is such a wonderful technique for sketching this is also why white sketchbooks suck okay is because you're using the tone of the paper to create a base therefore the black okay image of the pencil is going to act as your mids to your darks and then you come back in at the very end with white and your white acts as a highlight and that highlight enables you to shift and get these wonderful reads and here's a great example of a master who was doing that type of sketches these are his prelim sketches before he would dive into things now some of you have had um, depending on who your basic drawing instructor was some of you have had a basic drawing class where you did stuff like this this is great this is when you're using a Strathmore, Strathmore based paper, or maybe a Canson paper. You're coming in with some type of charcoal, and then you're coming in with white highs. How many people did this in some type of basic drawing? Okay, some, good, a lot of, a lot of you have. So all we're gonna be doing is basically taking this technique, and we're gonna be merging it digitally, and we're gonna be doing that in our sketchbooks on a regular basis. It's funny, a lot of people that have done this inside a basic drawing class, um, they sort of leave the technique some way. They just leave it alone they don't use it anymore it's a wonderful technique that you should keep you should hold on to and not lose okay it's it's one of the best techniques I've seen for drawing so um, I, I have a couple samples here of some other base props I'm gonna go ahead and pull some of these up for I want to show you this example here's a figure drawing example I discovered here look at how wonderful that is okay so the, one of the powers of this technique is it enables you to get in there and to use the white as a contrasting element to even contrast against parts of the tone. Okay, we'll talk about this a little bit later. There's sort of three techniques that you can apply in this. One of them is this. The white becomes a contrasting element against the tone, therefore allows elements of the tone to pop forward. Don't get that confused. When you look at this, this, uh, this drawing sketch here of the figure, you can see also highlights on the wrist, on the knuckles, on the legs, on the bony landmarks of the body. So look at the bony landmarks that are getting hit. Look at the clavicle up here, um, even up here, part of the, um, the forehead's being hit. You can see the wrist hit here. Um, you can see, well, you know, a little bit of change here between the deltoid and bicep. But look down here, you know, all these highlights coming across there. That's going back in with that white pencil, not nearly as bright. That is one basic technique. This is sort of a contrast method, okay? Another simple technique is called outlining. It's where you draw something, and a lot of students do this. I know Christine likes to do this a lot. Is you draw something, just basic. The tone of the paper is holding it. You use little highlights, but then you take a white, thick line, and you go along and you draw a white outline on top of that, and that sort of creates a contrast that allows the image to sort of pop off the page, allows you to see it a little bit more. Okay. And then there's another variation, and this is sort of, um, this is 
these are, I thought, some really cool uh, sketches done by an artist here. Some um, uh, ship sketches, right? Uh, what's really nice about this is it's just black line and then hitting it with like a 20 grade marker in the middle. So if you look in here, you'll see like a little 20 or 40 grade marker that's being used. So they're using the tone of the paper, a 40 grade marker on top, and then still coming back with a white. Okay, so one of the secrets to this is the white is one of the last steps that you want to do. It's not one of the first steps you want to do. One of the first things you want to do is you want to really develop the underscore of the drawing, which is going to be your perspective, your, your form. We've been talking about that in this class, about drawing and shapes, drawing center lines. And if I go around and see some of you guys skip that, because I already have students go, no, I draw a shape and I don't. No, you have to have a center line in there. You have to break down the basic shapes, right? Then we come back a little bit later. You can apply tone. So again, here's sort of another method. First, we had the contrast. So we had the outline. Here's using markers in there, adding another level of tone, where basically that tone contrasting with the white highlights allows these ships to pop off of there, OK? And basically, from this point, here, I'm just going to click. There's a bunch of props here. This is what we're going to be doing. You guys are going to be going through, sketching up, a bunch of versions and I'm going to start off with some basics and talk a little bit today about creating shading uh, gray scales okay but look at this we're going to go through and these are just really simple easy fun drawings from looking at cars looking at vehicles looking at plants looking at organics okay and I'm going to have you guys for the next couple weeks I want you to start filling pages because this type of sketching like this right here this is golden stuff to put inside a portfolio page this especially with the prop design class being offered next semester, right? This is something that we're going to work very heavily on, right? So some of this, I mean, for example, that tank over in the left-hand corner there, right? That's a Sherman tank. We don't, we're not going to go in and draw every detail. I'm going to teach you a couple of basics today about finding an area of detail and focus and then having an area of what we call fade off or drop off, okay? And so that's something that you're going to notice it's pretty common with a lot of these drawings is you're going to find one area that has, look at that, I thought that was pretty cool. So that was in someone's sketchbook. We're going to have an area that's going to be defined with some little highlights. And then other areas of the drawing, we want to let it fade off. Does anybody know why we want to do that? We want to have a drop off there. We want to create what's called lost and found edges. If we go into a drawing and we render out the rim, and we render all the knobs on the tire, and we render the reflection in the mirror, and we render the front of the car, and then we render the, the little piping that goes around the side of the trim. That gets to be too much, and it kills a drawing. And part of being successful, those of you that are, have any interest in being, going into concept art, okay, in developing environments, creatures, and so on, part of that success is knowing when to stop in drawing or designing or painting, meaning that you have something, when we look at this, there's shape and structure that is existing there for that car, okay? So what's really important is we know when to back off. So we put a couple highlights in one area. You, I want you to think, I'm going to use a couple terms like a focal point or a, what I call a punch area that has an area of contrast with white against black. And then the other parts of the vehicle can fade off. Is there a ton of white highlights in the back of this vehicle right here? No. There's highlights in the front here by... So one thing you want to do is think about one area on your drawing that might be catching the most amount of light, okay? And that can be an area that might be dictated if there's light coming from a particular angle. That light might be hitting the front of the vehicle or the side of the vehicle. And because of that, there might be, also think of the texture variations, there might be more texture, there might be more little angled curves or elements that are popping forward that allowing you to get in there and place some highlights in there, okay? Planes, okay, great for sketching. Because they're simple shapes, they're simple primitive shapes that are covered with basic contour lines and then you go on top of there, you put some detail in there and then bam, you could go in and put some highlights in there as well. Okay, um, I found this, let me see if I can go through this. I thought this was pretty cool because this also applies to everything else. Look at this. This is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. I'm going to get into, we're going to create textured patterns of grad gradients. Okay, going from dark to light, using, using different types of linear drawing functions. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But look at here. Look at this palm tree here, all right? See the little outline technique there? Look at a little contrast here, a little bit of highlight there, but then it's faded off a little bit. This works great. Look at the waterfall. 
See how there's just rocks that are sketched in here, then the water is what's white and it's left. So when you're working in this technique, you really need to think about contrast somewhere along in your, your drawing. Is that, that's why you don't want to start with the white, start with the basic sketch, but be rough and loose and then come back and highlight a couple areas and then sort of leave it. Again, this looks golden in a portfolio. Okay, um, look at this example here. You'll see the outline technique in there. You'll also see some highlights in there, some leaf highlights. You also see some hatching variations. Okay, so um, this is what we're about to talk about right now. We're going to talk about this discussion of how to create gradients that we can use because different linear gradients, okay, going from dark to light, apply on different textures. So I'm going to show you a couple of basic ones, but here's one right here, which is a series. Some people, I, I know some people that have called this three or four line technique, where you're basically developing three or four lines turned to different angles, and you're going from a dark and then you're going from a light. Okay, another way, uh, if, so if you look in some of these sketches, you're going to start to notice little uh, grading and hatching techniques. Okay, so if you look in here, the, when I is referring to grading, I'm talking about creating gradients or gradations, right? Some of these hatching techniques are straight line, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Some are going to be multi-hatched. You can do some with circles. There are organic shapes to think about because if you're drawing a leaf, you might have a different hatching technique on that leaf as compared to a car because that's a different type of vehicle with a different type of surface and texture. Okay, these are all really important things to think about. Okay. Let me just go through uh -oh, a couple of these basics here. And let me see if I can just pawn through some of these drawings. Trains are great. They're wonderful. Why? Really simple core primitive shapes again. Okay. They are, you know, basic um, elements. When, when you look at this, it's a basic cylinder with a couple other cylinders. You pick light source direction. You put a little bit of hatching on there. See how there's a nice highlight up in here? This area isn't even fully defined right here. It doesn't need to be. It's just a quick sketch. These, are, these drawings are meant to be sketches that you're conducting in somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 minutes maximum. Boom. Then you go to the next one, and then you go to the next one. We're not sitting there cranking out tons and tons and tons of detail. We're trying to move along. And the more of these that you do in a fast pace, okay, working digitally, the better off you're going to get. Okay? All right. So with that said and done, I will post that information up for you guys a little bit later. Okay? Um, I also have some brace base props that we're going to start with today. Okay? I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a couple plants. And we're going to do some type of a wooden cart that you can add on to yourself. Um, and then eventually, after those base props, we'll start getting into some other vehicles. Okay? We'll start getting into some airplanes and tanks and so on. Okay, so let's let's come over here. First thing I want to do is, as we continue forward with this, is I want to pull up um, Sketchbook Pro here, and I just want to talk about some basics in here and creating these what I call these gradient paths. Okay, this is something I was really lucky back in the gosh, when was it? I can't even add up in my head. I was exposed to some of this when I was in seventh grade. I had a really cool drawing teacher. His name was Mr. Mr. Graber at Bernarda Yorba Junior High, okay? So what I'm going to do here on this tone paper is I'm going to be working, I don't like working in pure black. I like to pick like a little bit of a base gray and, you know, maybe a little bit closer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and basically, I want you guys to be doing the same thing. I'm going to create a box like this, okay? About yay long. Now what's cool, um, I already made a mistake here. Does anyone know what my mistake is? That's right, I'm not on another layer, okay? Um, so, what I'm going to do is Command Z real quick. Just trying to get you guys to make sure you're paying attention. Um, if you want, you can lock that layer. So now you can't draw on it. And then lock your paper layer, and then you can add another layer up above it. So you see how I locked it in Sketchbook? It's really easy. Drag down to the lock, and then you can unlock it as well. Now I can draw. So if I come here and I try to draw, nothing happens. That way I'm not drawing on the paper. The reason why for this is you don't have to upload the paper every time. It's there, it's, and you can just keep working on top of it, okay? All right, so let's go back. Let's talk about our gradients here. So what I want you guys to do is this. I want you to create a bar like so, okay? And you can zoom in to this a little bit too. So what I'm going to do is, oops, I'm going to take this right here. I'm going to go to my marquee. I'm going to select this. I'm going to copy and paste it, save myself time. And then I'm going to go ahead, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to go ahead and move this. I'm going to put one down here below like so, and then I'm going to do it again, okay, uh, deselect. Now I can do both, right? 
copy paste all right I'm gonna bring both down here like this all right and I want you to do a minimum of five and paste trust me if you do this and you hang with Phil on this hold on a second let me see if I can move all these up Ah, it's not letting me do it it's only letting me do it through selection and I already cut off that other area there okay so give me a second here I'm gonna just delete that lower section here okay there we go so there we go we have five basic boxes in there okay what we're gonna do is now we're gonna go in and we're gonna talk about making gradient pathways that go across okay what is a traditional gradient pathway that most of you have already learned okay is a basic hatching right so let's just we can write a couple of these down here on the side okay we have hatching okay and hatching is going to consist of us just basically all right someone's calling me there hatching to define that we can have basic hatching like this right running this way we can also what happens when we cross the streams right we get cross hatch right so those are basics okay all right so that's one that we already know so if i come over here and i start working across okay it's literally this easy okay i can start and again i'm going from dark to light so i can start here and start putting a lot of dark in here and then my goal is by the time i get down to here i want to have it be really open and then as i come down here it starts getting a little bit heavier and heavier and heavier so that's our basics right so if I sit here and I spend a couple minutes, increase my brush size a little bit. This is also really important because this is also establishing your pen and control line within a box. Now, um, if you want to, and if you're a little bit meticulous like me and you want to come back in here, if you want to cross the hatch, go the other way, that's fine. If you want to get rid of, if you want to take the marquee tool and get rid of the little areas of overspray, that's totally fine. Okay, we're going to keep going in this until we fill this all the way up. This is just a basic. Now, on this one, like I just mentioned a second ago, all right, let me go back to my pencil here. Uh, we could do, we can do, we have hatching in one direction. So I'm going to put directional hatching. And then we also have cross hatching. Okay, another method is called three or four line. Okay, and there's different. People have different abbreviations for them or different things, but you can also think of it as rotating pattern. Okay, so here, let me let me finish this. I'm fortunately I'm doing this super fast because of the demo. So my goal is to try to get this to be the more of these angle lines I get in here, I want it to get pretty close to being dark, right? So you want to have a really good gradient in there. Because that might be the dark shadow of something. And then as I get back here, I'm gonna to try to thin it down a little bit and allow it to breathe a little get some more spacing that's happening in there okay all right so let me just keep going here for a minute so somewhere in here I want to make sure I'm pretty close to almost like a full dark value okay and then as I come back in here sort of lighten it up a little bit and you know what if you do this guess what some of you have never done this before quite a while your arms can start to hurt your supinator muscle right here going to start to kill because you're doing this but that's okay you're going to build that muscle up and get a little bit stronger okay that's a basic here's my basic value there's a 10 there's a one this one over here is basically down to the the basics of the paper and i could still push this but i'm just trying to trying to move a little bit faster for the demo here okay trying to get very light down here it almost just comes completely to one all right three or four line really simple we go like this one two three four cross again one two three four one two three four one two three four and i'm rotating them these patterns okay i want to try to have all of them be at different angles and then i can come back and darken a couple of them up so this demo outside of today we're also going to do a demo then on thursday as well this is going to be a multi-day demo as we keep working across here. So I'm going to keep going in here. And I'm just rotating the pattern. Now as I start to branch out a little bit more, I'm going to start to increase a little bit more of the, of the pacing that I'm doing. And start to spread out a little bit more of the lines very sort of slowly.
Can you see how this technique would be really great for working on some type of a very highly textured element, like a weight, like one of those baskets, a woven basket, or some type of a rug, or some type of a... heavy blanketed wool item or something like that, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and go to the end here where I'm just really going to open up my lines. Try to get down to like the base of the brown paper. Okay. Now I could come back here. Remember, I wanted to try to get to a pure black. So I know I'm going to have to really darken up a couple of these. I might increase my line weight just a little bit back in here. These gradients are important because unfortunately artists, we tend to be, we tend not to be good at remembering things in the application process. For example, you're taught all these methods of drawing, but then when people go sit down to draw in their sketchbooks, they forget a lot of the work that they've been taught, and they don't do it. Okay. Here, let me add a couple more. Okay, so there, that's my new gradient. Look at that, 10 to 1. Okay, that's another texture method. So we've done a couple variations in line. We have stipple. Don't do stipple. Don't sit there. I just don't want to hear someone like this on a $2,000 Cintiq, like tagging the Cintiq, right? We want to do something else right now. Here is where I want you to think about organics too. Okay, circles. Circles are great. Variations of circle patterns, those were great. What are organic elements that you might want to draw? If you draw rocks, if you draw trees, bushes, anything in the ocean, right? Those are organic elements. They're going to have different texturing on their exterior surfaces. So now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start doing this. Start taking a bunch of circles. Some of these can overlap each other a little bit. And then as I move out, I'm basically going to start to lighten up the circles. You can overlap. When you do this, it's really hard in the beginning because then after you're getting into it, you start doing this. You start creating curly cues because you're trying to make really fast circles. And it's sort of hard to sit there. But I'm telling you, I've seen this pay off in sketching where you're just sketching like something that has a very organic or you're working on like a dragon and it has a cool surface to it. Okay. So what I'm going to start to do when I get back to here, I'm going to have a couple circles a little bit more spaced out. Some people just let it go blank. I like to have something that indicates part of the texture. Fortunately, I made my strips really large so you guys can see them on the monitor and it shows up a little bit more. I would probably, you can make these a little bit thinner so you don't have to sit here and let me go through. Let me try to get these down here. Now from this point I'm going to try to create a little bit more space between some of my circles. Now the other thing too that I'm doing is I'm not putting all my circles like this. Look, dot, 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 dot. That's overkill. I'm trying to have them flunk, I can't speak, fluctuate. And look at what I'm doing here. I put one here, one down here, one there. I'm trying to create sort of like what I call an S pattern or a rhythm, some type of, of variation there. Why? I'm doing that because in nature, when you start, if you start drawing like a frog or a tree or something, it's going to have really base patterns like that. They're not going to be, they're going to be random algorithms and patterns and not everything just flows in an order, okay? So now that I have that there, I'm going to come back here and start darkening up a couple of my circles. I can overlap a couple of them. I'm trying to get down to like almost like a base black over here. And then once I get that down, I have to sort of come back in here. So you can do this. There's so many different ways you can do this type of a texture gradient, okay? This is also, folks, a secret to painting digitally in Photoshop, is if you create these types of texture gradients, 
that are all ready to go and you have them, you can pull them up and apply them to objects as overlays and create wonderful little patterns of texture very quickly on an object, okay? All right, so that's another one. So I, those are three basics, right? I'm going to mark this one. This is circles. Okay, and oops, out of habit, I'm doing the space bar. And I forget I have to use my move tool. So let's try another one. Let's try something different. What if I had something that has scales on it? So on this one, how about I do, this might take me a little bit longer, but what if I do squares? My circles here wasn't quite finished. I'm just trying to expedite it. Let me break some of these up a little bit more and get a little heavier. It's not quite perfect 10 there. Let me just sort of... But see, now I'm really swirling the pen. You can see how much faster I'm moving it. I'm trying to get it just a little bit more... have a gradient effect happening there. There we go. Remember, dark to light. 10 and then a 1. Okay. All right, next year, like I said, let's try squares. You know, you can come up with so many different shapes that apply to the different objects. So on this one, I'm going to try this. I'm going to start with a base square, square. It gets a little hard because you start moving faster. It gets harder to keep that square. But that's all right. Maybe I end up with these sort of sideway L's, but they start to look like patterns for scales. This is great in drawing a fish, drawing a dragon, sketching something with armament on them. The other thing that I could do on this that I haven't done yet is I can adjust the size, the scale size of an object, right? So with my little triangles here, I might be drawing them larger. When I get down here, I might have this. See how much smaller I'm making them? You see how that could apply to feathers of a bird? It could apply to fish scales. That'll be the next demo. We'll talk about how to apply this, this technique and these gradients. But I want you to think about some of these variations. Now, for me, it's actually, as I'm doing these, since they're like little triangles, little squares turned, right? It's harder to draw them in an angle like this than it is if I rotate the paper. Because if I rotate the paper, I'm just using my my wrist going the other direction. So in this example here, I might do that. I might come over here. Let's go to rotate. I'm going to rotate my, my paper up here. I'm going to move it up to like so. Okay. And now I can just come in here like this and finish them off. I've seen people get so anal with this, they get like every other one in there. What I mean by every other one is you have a row like this, right? And then you get the other one. Now, do you see how much longer this takes? It takes a lot longer to do this, but it's a really valuable method. You know, I can have some really cool textures in here. Try to go faster. Start creating these swirly swirls. See, that's the problem. It doesn't quite look as good if I move too fast. Let me go back here. I want to darken a couple of these. Bring them in closer. <laughs> what am I at? I'm at 34 minutes, and I'm almost done with four of my little texture variants on this demo. Okay, I'm gonna try to go real fast. This is where I want to draw with my other hand. I have two hands going at the same time. So this one takes a lot longer. It takes a little bit more practice to really get in there. Just be patient. Okay. 
And then let me come back here. Let me darken some of these here. But this is how you do it. Especially, this is really important when you get into like digital painting. If you have a, a character that has dragon skin, or you're you know developing a warrior, and he has some other type of heavy coat-like material, this is how you have to do that. Okay. All right. Um, let me just get a couple of these, a little bit more of a gradient happening in here. All right, another one. Let's try three lines curved, okay? So on this one, I'm gonna do three or four lines, but I'm gonna take them and I'm gonna curve them like this. And I'm gonna put them in different patterns. This could be great for organic services. I use this one a lot and I use it for trees and branches where I come in here like this. And I have like one, two, three. probably for me one of the most common ones I like to use a lot because it there's a lot <laughs> happening it gets me in this habit of showing and rotating the form with those lines okay let me pause the demo for just a minute resume all right so there it is so look I I need to darken this up a little bit but you know you get the base point here by having these curved lines in here you now I could come back in and I can just darken it a little bit more and then I could start, I'll start to get that gradient feel. But what's really cool about this, and again, I'm doing the demo, so I'm trying to do it as fast as I can here, okay? It's actually easier if I had a, just doing it traditionally, I could turn the paper to the side, but that's okay, it works great for here. So do you see, look at the difference in the textures that I've created right there. Can you see the reeds that are happening? I mean, I have, I have one reed that's like, that's a scratchy base, that's not even crosshatch, it's just a linear going across. This other one feels much more textured. This other one with the round, with the little circles, feels like much like scales of some kind. It, it reminds me of like, a, you know, the basis of like some type of jellyfish or something that might be on that type of surface texture. This one feels like scales or like bird feathers. Um, this one down here is much more rough. So do you see what's happening? You could come up with any little texture pattern yourself. And what's really cool about doing this, you can apply this, you got to think digitally. Imagine if you create this strip I just did, and you can actually do this with a brush, actually in Photoshop a lot faster too, is it imagine if you did a texture pattern with this, with S's. What if you had one with C's? What if you had one with swirls like that? Okay, you know how cool a pattern of swirls would look like? In Photoshop, we could define that as a brush. We can go into brush presets. We can even change the balance settings. And then you can sit there in a box and create these gradients really quickly. So anyway, that's the first part of what we're going to do. And the reason why this is so important is that we're going to be taking these basics. And I want you to have an understanding of how, if I didn't cover this information, most of you would start drawing a tank or a tree. And you're going to use the same basic, comfortable gradation method, which is going to be usually this one right here, number one. This is probably the most commonly used. Okay, second most commonly used is its twin sister or brother right there is going to be crosshatch. But there's a whole other world after that of, you know, multiple lines, circles, triangles, semicircles, whatever your little minds can think of. In fact, a friend of mine did one like this in Photoshop, and he's able to take that, stamp it, and it had this really cool, like, scale effect. It was, like, totally different than anything else I'd seen. So even in Photoshop, you can even have white in the middle, technically. So when you stamp over the next one, like this, you don't see the interior line in there, which is really cool. Because if there's white in the middle, you take it as a brush, and then you just stamp it all over. It's going to have a really cool effect when you start to do that and paint, you know, and create really cool textures. Okay, so after this part, I think what I'll do real quick right now is I'm just going to, out of my head, I'm just going to draw like a leaf and a plant structure and talk about how, how I would apply this to my drawing. In fact, I could just come over right here and just start to sketch. So I'm going to draw, I, I had some reference for you, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw something out of my head here. Where I'm going to start with some basic shapes. So I'm going to imagine I have a horizon line like up here. Okay, I'm going to start with a series of leaves. So what's the first thing I did in my sketch? What we always do in our sketch. Put the horizon line in, always. 
So I start with a little sketch here. I realize the reason I'm doing that is that if I come up here and if I'm going to draw a leaf right here, can you see what I just did? I drew a little quick box with a center line down the middle. Because now I understand if my horizon line is right here, I'm going to be looking up at that, okay? Versus if I come down here and I start to draw a little box like this, center line, right? I'm looking down on top of my leaf. The other part's just the interior detail and how stuff connects. But what happens if I have a leaf that breaks? So this is a standard leaf that goes up here, curves in here, comes back down, and then curves here in the middle like so, right? Connects back to here. Get this part comes back down. So that's me looking sort of up at this leaf. But what happens if I have a leaf that does this? So you can just draw the base shape there. Okay, start with simple planes, center lines, center line up there, center line comes down. See how that connects. I might come over here. I had this leaf. This leaf is sort of boring because it's just going straight across. What do leaves do? Understand the subject matter that you're drawing. What's the purpose of leaves? To gather light and also to reach out to gather water. So when it's cold or misty and it rains or you have a cold morning, most leaves are like this. Look at my arms. They're at an angle. They're like this because when water forms and you get lots of moisture, the water will turn into little droplets and then the droplets will roll downward and go into the leaves. So what are the chances I'm going to see a leaf that goes straight across? Not as well. Most leaves tend to be at angles. They tend to arc up because that's the part that gathers the water. Then they tend to curve down because that's the part that might be exposed to the sun for photosynthesis, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and just draw a series of planes and I'm going to make sure my planes are being consistent with where my horizon line is. So I know if I'm looking down on something and if I have something that comes up this way and then bends back this way, I'm going to make sure that this is all matching up. So I'm going to have a base. So I'm going to put a little base to my leaf here. I'm going to come up here. Now this is where I can start getting into some detail there. Okay. Now I could come in here. Now that I have the base shape drawn there, I could come in here. There might be a little bit of a roundness to this. Sometimes the ends of the leaf get a little banged up. Okay. I'm trying to get a thick and thin line in there. Right. I'm not coming back into my drawing right now and having just, it's not one constant super thick line. Right. I'm going to come into this other leaf here. I have a center line that's going down the middle. My leaf might come over here. It's going to have a little bit of a bend over there. Okay, now I'm going to see the back side where it's coming down here. Okay. Here's my other leaf going in this direction. Now, I'm making a lot of these leaves very similar. That leaf might connect up back in here. Okay, the other leaf might connect back up in here, let's say like this. And then let's, this comes back here. Might have a little corner there. Sometimes one side might be a little higher, might have been eaten by a little bit of a bug or something, right? And then I have this other leaf here. This one's a little bit taller there. So I just keep coming in and drawing in my planes and figuring out exactly what my direction is going to be. I have a leaf that comes up here and then it angles back this way a little bit and ends. So, like so, and then it. And then I had this other one here that was sort of coming in this direction from the back here. I'm looking up underneath it, right? And the leaf's going to come, and then it's going to drop back here. Okay. So that's it. Real base leaf structure, right, that I just drew real quick. Um, so what are some common things I had here? Number one, what did I start with? I started with the horizon line. Number two, what was I drawing with first? Basic shape. And in every basic shape sketch, I placed a center line. Okay? So even when I did any of these leaves, even when I came down here, look, I had a square, I put a line down the middle. That allows me to see the back side. Leafs bend. They're not just facing front. They're going to have a part that bends and curves. I have to draw through the shape and see where these connect to the other side. So if you want to get in there, and if you have to understand, like, hey, I'm under the horizon line right now, and if I'm looking at one plane that goes this way, then the plane curves this way, and I draw a little center line on it, then the rest of that is easy. Because now it's just getting in there, and it's adding just a couple little, oops, sorry, my pen slipped there for a minute. It's adding a couple little, I meant to do something like that, just a little detail out of habit. And then when I get up to the leaf shape, I might curve some of my leaf shape, bring it to a point, 
but I understand where it connects the center line how that continues through and I understand how this backside matches up okay that's it now let's talk about little patterning that I can do my leaf is going to have an edge to it right so now I could come on let's pick pick a pattern that might work I can start with the circles I can do the lines I'm just because of the direction of this I'm going to just do like a straight line like this and I know look right in here I'm going to have an edge so I'm going to come right here and I'm just going to do some real simple sort of cross hatch that goes across to show the surface there. I'm going to show a little bit of that surface going in this way. Okay. Um, I might rotate my lines going along with the curve of the leaf. So when I get up here, these might be a little bit more curved this way. And they might curve a little bit more like this. Okay. And then I might sort of have some coming over here. These might angle off a little bit because there might be a deformation or a curve in the leaf. So I'm going to do that to a couple more. I'm not going to totally come in here and kill it. I'm just going to try to get some more detail in a couple of these. All right, now, we talked about up here going 10 to 1, right? I'm just going to imagine light's coming from the top. If light's coming from the top, what is the back of my leaf under the curve going to be? It's going to be like, a, yeah, like an 8 or a 9. It's going to be darker. So now I could come in here, and I can darken up a couple of these lines. And by doing that, that's going to get the top surface to sort of pop out a little bit because that's the area that's going to be in shadow. I can come back here. What happens when if I take two objects, if I take my hands and I put them really close together? The closer two objects are together, the less amount of light that's traveling in between them. So that way, if I come over here and I start to get some little gradients happening in there, try not to make them all the same size. Make one maybe a little smaller. Maybe one's a little bigger. Maybe one curves a little this way. And it curves back this way. So when I get down in here, I might make this a little bit darker because the leaves are getting closer to each other and they're going to sort of overlap. Now, if I keep doing this to every single leaf, I'm going to kill the drawing. I'm going to overwhelm it with detail. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pick a couple key leaves. And then these are my key leaves that have the most detail. Let me put a couple lines on this underneath there so it's darker, right? Then I'm just going to come in here and pick like one area and put like one area with a little bit of detail. Going in here, maybe a little bit there. On this back side, maybe a little bit here. Okay. That's it, and then I'm gonna leave it alone. I don't wanna go in there and overkill the drawing. If I keep putting tons of detail, I'm gonna kill it. The next thing I do, my last step, if you wanna do this on a separate layer, if it makes you feel a little bit better, you can. And you could label that layer your whites or your highs. I can now come in here with a white, and then I could come in here. Now, the first thing that I like to do, some people will overkill a drawing, and I'll show you that in a minute. First thing you want to do with white is white light is hitting edges. It's going to be hitting the corners of edges where the planes are changing. So when I look at my leaf here, a definitive line mass that I'm going to have is going to be like right in here, right on this edge. Do you see that? Right there. So if I get a little highlight, and then lightly fade it off and bring it down a little bit lower. It gets that little edge that's rounding in there, right? Then I could come in here, you know, and I could, there might be a little bit of a highlight on that surface there. I might have a little bit here. I might have a little bit of a highlight hitting that corner. Okay. I might put just a little bit there, and then that's it. I leave it alone. I don't want to do anything more than that. The problem is most students will do this. So they come in. And they don't know when to stop. They're like, yeah, I love a highlight. And oh. they just, they keep coming in and they're like, yeah, highlight here. <laughs> and then they keep putting more highlights. And, and then what happens is you, you, you just killed it. You flattened the drawing. There's no sensitivity. Light breathes. Light casts and it hits something. And then it breathes across the surface and decides what texture or pattern it's going to bounce. Okay? Light has degradation to it means that after it casts and hits an object it's going to degrade and get lower depending on the intensity and how the light's traveling so all I have to really do is come in here right now and just find a couple little spots put a couple highlights okay I might have a little bit of a highlight on the back of one of these little legs right here and then I do a little fade off like this just a light line that comes behind it I might come in here put a little bit of a fade in there. Might have a little bit of an edge right there. Okay. 
You'll start learning where to do this and then where not to do it. That's it. And then even on the dark side there, they're still going to catch a little bit of a rim light there, right? So I can come over here and I can just put a little indication of like a highlight going over that side. I might punch up that a little bit. And I might put a little bit on the... Now when I get out to the other pieces here, I'm just going to put less. It's just going to be like supportive. I might have a little piece there. I might have a little heading part of the edge here and here. A little bit right here, thick and thin it, right? And then I might come over here and just sort of be like, okay, that edge right there might have a little, so it goes over like so, like that, okay? That's it. I don't need to come in there and keep putting tons of highlights. I just put a couple little suggestive. Let the rest fade off. My core highlights are right here. You see that? My core highlights are here. That's my focal point for my viewer. Everything else I want to be a fade off. All this is just going to fade off, OK? All right, that's it. I just leave it alone. Now, remember those? we talked about those other two options. If I wanted to, I really want to get something to pop in there. I could create an area of contrast. I can do an outline. So if I wanted to create an area of contrast, all I could do, and a lot of artists will do this, they'll come in like this. And you can just see it happen. It's sort of magic. Just pick a couple areas. And now if I come in here, I, um, a friend of mine at grad school does this all the time in her drawings when she does character designs. As she comes in here. Uh-oh. I just changed something. There we go. And you know what? Even when you do this white, you can even put that in a in one of your box variants. You can have it with line. You can have it with however you want. Oops. You can fade it off a little bit if you want. Do something like that. Here you go. That's it. So you see how now I got that area to pop. I would be using an area of contrast behind it if I wanted to. Let's see how far I can go back in Command-Z. Oh, stop me at a certain point. Um, another option that we talked about before is just doing a hard line around that. We'll get to that a little bit later. But you understand the basics here of what I just drew really quick. Okay? The secret now is you guys are going to have to learn is knowing when to, when to level off, basically, when to stop. So when you start putting in detail with black, it's when to be expressive in one area and have little milks and crannies. And then let the other side of it just fade off. Let it be suggestive detail. Okay? What part of that comes back to is this. Let me just go through this really quickly. Okay? There's a man, he's a German psychologist named Gestalt. And he created something called the Gestalt theory. And this, and this is what the Gestalt theory is. Okay? What shape is that? It's a circle, even though I drew it a little crooked, right? Part of his theory was that the human brain, the cognitive learning abilities, would piece together these little parts here that are missing. And we see shapes. We see in round areas. So I was actually sitting in grad school talking to a, one of my instructors in another class, but he's a, he's a total 3D sculpture guy. And, he didn't, and I made a comment about shape language. And he goes, well, what is shape language? I almost fell on the floor. I was like, I, you don't know what. No, it's a, an instructor who I have to take for a writing class, but he specializes in another type of art where he's not used to talking. They didn't know. And then another student who does like bronze pouring and everything, he didn't understand what visual reads were in shape language was either. And I was like, wow, that's like huge, you know. So anyway, basically when we look at those, those shapes, our mind pieces together what's there. What that means, there's a huge advantage to that. That means if I'm drawing something, if I'm drawing like a bunch of leaves in patterns of trees, I don't have to draw every single leaf. Some of it can just be really suggestive like this. My mind will look at all this and put that together and make me understand that that is part of this upper leaf system. That's just the lower leaf system. Does that make sense? So it's like you know when you draw trees as a child, you sort of do that a little bit because you end up doing this a little, right? 
and that's like your tree. And then you put the branches on it. The things you don't learn until later is that trees, all trees have a canopy to it, right? So then you start getting into shape and perspective. Then you understand the trees come to an end, and then this part under the canopy is always going to be in shadow. And then light comes from a direction, always above. And then you're going to have little parts that are going to be highlights, little core shadows, and you're going to have shadow underneath. Now your trees start to feel much more realistic, and they start to make sense. Okay, so all that goes back to Gestalt and that theory. So when I'm doing a drawing, and I'll do a more detailed drawing for you guys later, okay? If I come back here and turn this page back on, I don't have to finish that leaf. I don't need to, all I have to do is put little suggestive details like this and come down here and put stuff like that. You see that? There's a certain beauty in not finishing a drawing and just leaving it empty. I don't need to define all that up. You understand that that is, just by looking at that one little line there and there, you understand that that is a leaf inside a, a plant of some kind, right? That's all you have to do. We just make it simple. Take it easy. Okay? All right. So with that done, let me stop the demo. I'm going to render it. Any questions? Right? No? Some, some real basic stuff here. That, But now we're getting to do it digitally, which is cool. And what I love about Sketchbook Pro is that feels like graphite right there. And then yesterday, I got a wonderful brush. Always share with students. If you happen, Christina found a brush that does, that mimics pencil almost identically in Photoshop. There's a couple that are out there. I've downloaded a couple. She sent it to me. I was demoing it at home. It works fantastically. Okay. But anyway, I'm going to end that right there. Um, 